Dear Clara, Halloween is a yearly tradition here on Sodor. Each year, the engines come around the shed and tell scary stories. Personally, I think Edward has the best. We've been to a few ourselves and have heard of many frights, spectras, and ghost engines. But have you heard of the first Halloween on the island? Thanks to Thomas, Edward, and the others, they recounted their first Halloween to me for me to write about. I should foremention that it's not all things that go bump in the night. Many stories die deep into the horrors of our minds. Although they're long, cordling stories, I feel obligated to mention that they may cause discomfort to hear. I hope you enjoy them nonetheless. Sincerely, your best friend. The fall wind whipped through the station as Thomas shunted Fulcrum's good train into Platform 2. Thankfully, the pompous engine wasn't there yet. Instead, he switched lines to Platform 1 to get in a bit of rest before he had to shunt the next train. He sizzled nicely as a crowd of MONSTERS shrieked Thomas. He shot back, trying to flee the platform. Bob flung on the brakes as he was wrenched to a stop. Bob and Wade laughed as Thomas shrieked in horror. Settle down, boy, Bob told Thomas. Those are trick-or-treaters. Trick-or-treaters? Never knew her! N no, tr trick-or-treaters, Thomas. They're kids dressed in costumes who go to door-to-door -door asking for sweets. That sounds silly. It's a tradition for Halloween. Halloween? Yes, Halloween. How do you not know any of this? I think, Bob. You're making up silly words. But, but I I'm not. Th this is a thing. Kids dressing up for sweets? If I wanted sweets, I'd be myself. Who wouldn't love that? Knock, rolled Fulcrum as he backed onto his train. Original coming from you. Fulcrum inspected the platform as well. What revolting things, he shivered. Driver says it's for something called Halloween. What's a Halloween? That's what I'm saying. Look, Bob, even Fulcrum doesn't know, and he knows about everything stupid. Bob smacked his head as Wade chuckled. Halloween? whistled Edward, entering beside the two at another platform. Is a holiday celebrated once every year. Children go around taking sweets from strangers, while other kids go around pranking each other. The adults stay home and tell scary stories. Pranks? Scary stories? asked Thomas, highly interested now. Fulcrum rolled his eyes. You mean I can go out there and pull pranks on the others? Now, Thomas, don't get- Screw the signal, man! I'm going on the main line today! Bob flew on the brakes. Oh, no, you're not! Thomas had almost passed the gantry as he was flung to a stop, nearly impelling weight on the controls. Fulcrum laughed deviously as Edward smiled knowingly. Thomas was brought back into the station as the dressed-up children watched him. Suddenly, through the crowd, a toilet paper roll flew and hit Thomas on the nose. Ouch! cried Thomas as it left a trail of paper wrapped around his funnel, as it neatly caressed down onto his running board. Bob scrambled out of the cab and shunned the toilet paper off. Thomas smiled at it deviously. You know, went on Edward, back on my old rabbi, we had the tradition of telling scary stories. Do you think you all would mind if we could continue the tradition here? Would we? cheered Thomas. Fulcrum rolled his eyes. Scary stories of the children. Oh, come on! You're not scared, are you? teased Thomas. Me? Scared? Pa! Fine, I'll attend your poetry reading. Edward smiled. Great. See you all tonight at the sheds. With a peep peep from his whistle, the little blue engine set off. Edward came back later that night. The cold air whipped around his funnel as he left his trucks in the sidings. A fog had fallen upon the yards, giving a hazy atmosphere with the lights. Moths danced around the top of lampposts like small spirits as he made his way to the sheds. He found Thomas beside a workman's hut. Bob and Wade were inside with other staff, drinking cock cocoa before going to start a campfire for the Halloween stories. Thomas, meanwhile, snickered to a group of boys who hung from a wooden fence post. They wore devil's masks and blankets sheets like ghosts. Thomas, what are you doing? asked Edward, pulling alongside. He's here! Scatter! The boys all scrambled across the field back into the town. Oh, oh jeez, you scared me, Edward, panted Thomas. I thought you were, um, never mind. Fulcrum. The one and only, boomed the voice cutting through the darkness. Fulcrum emerged through the fog. It stuck around him like a blanket as he rolled his way back down into the shed. Thomas Scott. What are they going to do with him? asked Edward. Oh, let's just say that he's going to have his tenders stocked full of toilet paper, 
He winked, giving a large grin. Edward sighed as Bob, Wade, and a group of workmen exited the shack. How about you head over to the shed and we can get started? Alrighty! Bob and Wade climbed into Thomas's cab, the little tank engine reversed next to a groggy Henry. Edward followed suit, standing in front of the sheds. He coughed, announcing the engines. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our first Soto Halloween. Halloween? asked Henry. What's that? Some silly holiday where kids get fat off their sweets, coughed Gordon. And ghost, shivered Molly. It's when they come out. She glanced around nervously, huddling in her berth. Yes, went on Edward. Now, shall I start or does anyone have any stories? He looked around the shed. I have a story, scoffed Fulcrum, jumping forward. All eyes turned to him. Well, asked Thomas, go on. I call this one, he snickered, clearly trying to think of a name on the spot. Tim, the evil train. He paused for dramatic effect. He had expected some applause from the crews or cheers and whistles from the admiring followers. But it was only the old owl's hoot that cut through the nightly fog. He coughed, then began. There, um, there once was a tank engine named, um, Tim, and, um, he was very evil. Ooh, so evil. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, and one Halloween night, he was, um, he was pulling a passenger train. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, he was going down his branch line, pulling the passenger coaches he didn't deserve. Yes, 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 yes. Um, he was, uh, he was very evil because he, he's a tank engine. And, he, and we all know that tank engines shouldn't pull coaches. All the engines groaned as Fulcrum went on, and so the coaches wanted a wanted a proper engine. They wanted the Fulcrum of Buckingham to pull them. So what they did was shove Thomas, I mean Tim, off the viaduct. Wow, that was terrible. Well, that's not as awful of a story as a tiny tank engine like you could tell. He want to bet? Maybe on a Tuesday. What is that? Did I hear a, a chicken? Bah, 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 bah? Fulcrum stuttered. Fine, you go. My story is, laughed Thomas, Frank the Tyrannical Engine. Who names an engine Frank? Who calls an engine a chain? Frank was a very rude, meanie weenie engine who thought that all tank engines should bow to him. The engines groaned again. All the tank engines and a small tundra engine named, um, Eduardo didn't like him very much, so they all formed an alliance and threw him off the Vickerstown Rolling Bridge. Boom. The end. Way better than Frank's over here. Who's Frank? asked Fulcrum. The engines had clearly lost interest in telling stories and had now wanted to have a go at each other's necks. Edward was upset. Henry saw. He glanced between the engines, then spoke up. I have a story. Silence fell as both crews and engines looked on to him. It goes like, um, well... Once an engine attached to a train- Oh, for the love of God, Rid, your life is a tragedy play, not a horror, interjected Gordon. Now, if you wanted to hear a good story, I'll tell it. It's called Gordon the Big Engine Wins the Football Ball. We're telling scary stories, barked Thomas. You don't understand cinema. What's a cinema? I don't know, it just came to me. Edward surveyed the sheds of yelling and turmoil between the engines. He sighed as he tried to compose himself. He made a nice out of steam as peep. He whistled gracefully as they cut through the night air. It rang in the engine smoke boxes as their bickering subsided. They all stared back at him, waiting for his next move. If you're all done, he finally said, I have a story to share. The engines glanced between each other. When no one else attested, Edward continued, I call this one Alice, the arrogant engine. Once upon a time, there was a very stubborn and pompous engine named called Alice. Alice worked on a railway with many other engines. She was the main express engine and was very uptight about her position. I'm the best and most important, she would tell the others. Of course, the controllers want big, important engines. She would jab at the older, weaker engines and the small tank engines. She was rude with the coaches as well, who tried their best effort to treat her kindly. Be dears and keep quiet. You're meant to be seen, not heard, she would say as they talked at the station. 
She was very mean, and most of the engines didn't like her. Eventually, she had gotten into an argument with one of the engines in the shed one night before she had an evening run. She left in a very sour mood as she backed down onto the train, biffing and bumping the coaches about. Ooh, ooh, do be careful, ooh, ooh, do be careful. They went as Alice brought them roughly into the station. Alice ignored their cries as the passengers boarded. Soon, she set off down the line. She was still thinking about her argument from that night, and was not paying attention to the line ahead of her. Soon, the next station began to approach. If only she had been paying attention, for someone had fallen down into the track bed. Their suit had gotten stuck in between the sleepers and couldn't get up. Bystanders tried to help and flag her down, but she didn't hear until it was too late. Edward sighed as he finished his story. All the other engines stared at him, shooken. Bravo! cried Thomas at last. Edward, that was brilliant! coughed Henry. That was <clears throat> quite good, spluttered Gordon. It was all right. Doesn't seem believable, though, scoffed Fulcrum. The others coughed and ignored him. Does anyone else have a story? asked Edward. Um... I supposed I could recount an event, roared Gordon. What's your story called? asked Thomas. Um, a name, um, mm, tunnel vision. And this is what Gordon told. Back in Gordon's old railway, he was one of many of his class. They all went by different names. There was, of course, Flying Scotsman, as you may know, but there was also Royal Lancer, Gay Crusader, and Great Northern. All were grizzly built engines, and they all took pride in it. Sometimes too much. They were a boastful family, anyone would agree. Gordon simmered under the canopy of King's Cross as the sun shone down on his lovely green apple paint. He was waiting for his connecting train. Soon, a puffing drew into the platform beside him. Took you long enough, boomed Gordon. I got stuck at the tunnel, panted the engine. It was very similar to Gordon. The same boiler, the same wheels, the same everything, all except for their face and name. A shiny board on their wheel arch read, Great Northern, snickered Gordon. The one and only, smirked the engine. You're late. Only by a bit. There was an accident at the tunnel. I was held up waiting for them to clear it. You must know that we have to keep up our reputation. Not just to the public, but to our brothers and sisters as well. We are the oldest and must show our kin how Gresleys must do. And you? I heard you were delayed yesterday by ten minutes. I had to stop for photographers. They needed to see the true A1. Great Northern scoffed. So photographers are an excuse, but an actual delay isn't. Of course. Great Northern tethered. I should have expected this from you. Ever since you were purchased by that railway, you've been different. Different? Whatever are you talking about? Well, went on Great Northern, you haven't cared for any of us as of recently. Not me, Scotsman. None of us. You've been so distant, brother, and... I don't know if we'll ever see each other again. I, I'm worried for your well-being. You're going soft, grunted Gordon. But Gordon, shooting star to you. But shooting star, you're about to leave us, most likely never to see us again, and this is how you feel? Or are you? Great Northern inspected Gordon. He found out. Gordon darted his eyes away from his brother. You're scared, sighed Great Northern. You don't want to leave us, do you? You know that once you leave, you'll probably never see us again. You want to separate yourself so that you don't develop- Shut up, boomed Gordon. His grand voice echoed for the station. Great Northern said no more as the guard's whistle blew. Gordon left the station grimly. The big green engine made good time as he left the town. He thundered through the vast countryside and large cities. All the while, the thought of his siblings lingered in the far back of his mind. Soon, in the far distance, he saw it. A tunnel stuck to the side of the large mountain. Although he would never admit it, Gordon didn't like tunnels. He closed his eyes as he thundered into it. He couldn't admit his fear to anyone. It felt silly. Being afraid of a tunnel? It was silly. 
His reasoning felt more neutral nowadays, though. He kept his eyes closed, waiting to leave. He waited, and waited, and waited, but the end never came. He was puzzled at the speeds he was staring at. Surely he would have gotten out by now. Maybe it's just a very long tunnel, he thought. I'll be out soon. He kept going, and going, and going, but the light never bounded onto his eyes. That's odd, he thought. He winced an eye open, expecting to see dark clouds looming overhead. Maybe really dense clouds that the sun couldn't get through. But he was still in the tunnel. Just him, the filthy walls, and the triple straight track. Driver, does this tunnel seem long to you? He called back. He waited for a response. He waited. And waited. And waited, but no response ever came. Driver, oh come on, this isn't funny. But he still didn't respond. He tried the same thing with his fireman. But the same thing happened. He was growing concerned as he kept tearing through the tunnel. Had he thrown them out of the cab a while back? Had they passed out from the buildup of steam? He looked ahead, but there was still no light. This was odd. The tunnel was not that long. It couldn't be that long. Maybe I'm just going slow. But he knew that wasn't true either. The bricks were a blur on the walls. He was going at good speed, but even if he was going slow, surely he would have been out by now. Hello, he called. His meek voice echoed against the walls. He then had a terrible realization. What would happen if he became a runaway? His question was soon answered as he began to slow himself down. Slowly, Gordon came to a stop in the tunnel. More than five minutes had passed by now. Or had it been 20? He didn't threaten the concept of time right now. He had bigger things to worry about. Maybe if I just go back, I could just come out of where I came from. And if my crew had fallen out, then I can find them. Sir Gordon did just that. He ran back down through the tunnel. Occasionally, he would call out for someone. A few work unit doors hung by the side of the line. Surely someone was behind one of those doors. Soon, though, time came back to him. How long had it been? He felt like he had been there for a half hour now. Surely. Or had it been a full hour? He began to call out frantically for his crew now. At the times the tunnel winded, he tried his best to see behind him, but there was still no light. On and on he went, till he stopped. When will it end? He boomed. His smoke box ached. The tunnel had really gotten to him. He came to a stop and tried to recompose himself. How much time had passed now? Surely over an hour. An hour in a tunnel? He would have had to have found an exit by now. He tried to be logical about how tunnels worked. But time kept getting to him. Tunnels can't last for an hour, but it feels like it's been two. What's going on? Is anyone there? He argued with himself. Soon, he became tired and drifted off to sleep. He hoped, wished that this was all some dream. He woke up in the tunnel. How long had it been? Six hours? A day? Time didn't feel real anymore to him. Now, he supposes it never mattered. He tried to race out of the tunnel again. He went on and on for what felt like days, racing away, trying to get out of the tunnel. Soon his thoughts began to catch up to him. How could you leave them? He often muttered, clanking and wishing for a way out. His coaches were unresponsive as well. He would often hum to them as if they could hear him. He hoped that they could hear him, maybe even join him. Soon, what felt like days became weeks, and those weeks became months. One faithful night... Or day, he hadn't a clue. He had stopped from a long trip down the tunnel. Large bags rested under his eyes. He cooled down as he heard a sound. This sound wasn't one of the sounds he had grown accustomed to from his wheezing and whistling. It was coming from behind one of the work unit doors. He watched in fear as it rattled on its hinges. Before whatever it was came out, he ran away. He ran for what must have been another several days. His thoughts still attacking him. He kept running and running from whatever came out of that door. Soon, 
Weeks became months. The once grand engine became restless. He was at his wit's end. He began to question if he had even left the station. He didn't know if it was the tunnel playing tricks on him, or it was actually there, but he would sometimes hear the faint whistle of Great Northern and the chattering of the passengers. Was someone in the coaches? He could hear the sigh of what he thought was his driver in the cab, but there was still nobody with him. He raced, running from the whistle, the silent chattering, and the shaking of the doors. But no matter how far he thought he ran, it would always catch up to him. On and on through what must have been deep in the earth's crust. How long could a tunnel go? Gordon knew that question very well now. Forever. Months became unknown as he lost time. It felt like he had been down there for years, running for weeks and resting for the same time. One day, Gordon was very tired. One more run and I'll be out of this tunnel, he murmured to himself. He told himself this a lot. He always hoped that he would be right. Just keep going. You'll be out soon enough, he yawned. His eyes felt heavy. He kept running. On and on, while his eyes slowly... Warm steam hit his face as he raced out of the other end of the tunnel. Let me out of this damn tunnel! He screamed as he bats into the warm sunlight. He faltered as his crew giggled. Relax, Gordon, we've only been there for a minute. We're out now, laughed the driver. Gordon said nothing as he kept running, running away from that tunnel. He tried to pick up speed. Get away, get away, get away, he chanted under his breath. Gordon, Gordon is a changed engine now. Gordon is a changed engine now. He still doesn't like tunnels, but he misses his siblings dearly. And that's the story of Gordon the Tunnel Engine, declared Gordon, finishing the story. self insert much, quipped Thomas. Being trapped in a tunnel, isn't that a bit silly, tethered Fulcrum. Oh, how you know it can leave an impact on an engine? Speaking of tunnel engines, do you have a story, Henry? Inquired Gordon. Henry thought, I suppose I do, though I don't know if you all will believe it. Oh, please, Henry, it can't be that silly. All right, all right. I call this one Tunnel Grasp. Henry felt very silly. He longed to get out of his tunnel. Weeks had gone by, and he thought about his actions. Occasionally, he could hear the far distance of chatter in the town above the hill, Ellisween. Ellisween is a small, quaint town south of southern Ellsbridge. Henry had learned his geography of the surrounding area by now from overhearing conversations from the workmen who would occasionally come and perform maintenance on the tunnel. There seemed to be a lot of Ells towns. Above the ridge to the side of the hill, some townsfolks would come over, lean against the fence, and talk to him. He liked to talk with his friends. Mr. Lennox, the school's librarian, was a young man. He would always come out and read a story to Henry that the kids had chosen for the engine. Sometimes the kids would even come by and ask Henry for stories before he had gotten stuck in the tunnel. Reverend McManus would always come over and give a blessing to Henry every Sunday before Mass. And dear old Mr. Acheron would come by each night and sit in silence with Henry. Henry wouldn't have known his name if it wasn't for Mr. Lennox. Mr. Acheron had lost his son many years ago, and every night would take an evening walk with his wife. Recently, his wife had become sick, and he would have to take walks alone. The townsfolk never asked why he had done this, but poor Henry could only guess why he came. He sympathized with the old man every time he sat on the bench above the railway. But one night, Mr. Acheron never came. Henry waited and waited, but he never came and sat on his bench. Henry didn't pay mind to it. That night felt uneasy. The trees swayed precariously above the line. They once gave Henry comfort, but now they felt like they were attacking him. The bricks in the tunnel seemed to shift as well. He could have sworn that one had fallen and hit him on the boiler. The trucks that sat inside with Henry awoke as well. Henry gasped for breath as he heard an ear-shattering noise. Rocks. Falling rocks from the middle of the tunnel. Help! Help me! There's a cave-in! He shouted as town lights flickered on from above. He cowered in fear as the sound grew louder. Dust and rubble seemed to wrap around his wheels, bearing Henry in it. He shut his eyes, gasping for breath. Help! Save me! Let me out! He cried. Henry, what's the matter? Henry fluttered his eyes open as a lamp shone on his face. He blinked as it was drawn down. 
There, a group of townspeople stood in front of him, all in nightgowns. Cave in, he faltered. He glanced below him to see his wheels were clean of rocks. The trees swayed gracefully in the wind. It was as if nothing had happened. How could nothing have happened? It all felt so real. He felt that brick at him. Didn't he? What happened, Henry? urged Reverend McManus. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, it must have been a bad dream, gasped Henry. The townspeople murmured as they climbed up the embankment. Henry sighed as he listened to the trucks. They were all snoring again, as if they too hadn't experienced it. Of course they hadn't experienced it. It was all just a dream. He looked back in front of him to see Mr. Agron standing there, lingering. Oh, hello, sir. Do you need help up the hill? asked Henry. But Mr. Acheron slowly shook his head no. He waited for a little while longer, almost like he was trying to look into the tunnel. Of course, it was pitch black, so there wasn't much to see. He feebly turned and crawled up. Henry felt sorrowful for the man. He instead shook the thought and went back to sleep. The next day, Henry kept thinking about Mr. Acheron. He wondered why he hadn't come that night, and even more about his dream. Soon, Mr. Lennox had come with the newest book the kids had picked yesterday. Dombry and Son, presented Mr. Lennox. He was about to read when he noticed Henry's sour demeanor. He hesitated before jumping the fence and walked over to Henry. What's the matter? asked Mr. Lennox. Henry faltered. What happened to Mr. Acheron's son? he asked. Mr. Lennox faltered, taking a step back before walking back and forth. He stopped, standing in front of Henry, and told his story. Randall Acheron and his wife, Magnolia Acheron, lived on Ells Lane Avenue, the strip of road that separated Southern Ellsbridge to Ellisween. They lived a perfectly normal life with their son, Orion Acheron. They had hoped that Orion would live up to be a great man. They gave him everything he needed to be a someone. It wasn't until the day he came home one evening, presenting his parents with his new job. His parents had hoped that he would become a textile worker, or even a tailor. They were upset when they found out he had taken the role of a casual workman at a local company. His parents shunned him, and he was forced out of the house. He moved to Southern Ellsbridge, away from his parents, and made a life for himself. He married, had a wife, and kids. His job sufficed well. Many years later, the railway had begun construction of a new tunnel that their engine had proposed for. He and other men worked on boring and constructing it. They, however, had not constructed a tunnel before. They knew how to lay rails, maintain their engines, and drain harbors, but never build a tunnel. Orion and the men put all their brains together and bored the tunnel. They tried to stabilize the tunnel well while they lined the tunnel with bricks. Some suppose that they really didn't know what they were doing. Others blamed the company. Others simply wrote it off as they didn't realize how thin the tunnel roof was. Whatever happened, near the end of its construction, the middle of the tunnel caved in. It seemed everyone was safe. But then they realized Orion wasn't with them. The man frantically ran into the tunnel, digging at the cave collapse until they were shunned out by others. They supported the tunnel and cleared the mound of dirt and stone that had split it. They didn't find Orion's body, but they knew somewhere in the dirt of the tunnel lay Orion's body. They say he was built into the tunnel. His parents were distraught to leave on such poor terms. And every night for a very long time, the Acherons walked here to pay respects for the son that they lost. That's why the tunnel is divided in two. Mrs. Acheron hasn't been feeling well recently, and, and Mr. Acheron had been needing to tend to her. I see last night he didn't come. Henry suddenly looked down at his buffers. What was your dream like? Well, the wind began to pick up, and the trees began to rustle fiercely, almost like they would fall onto the line. Then, I heard rocks falling. I got so scared. I, I could have sworn that dirt and stones were surrounding my wheels, and a brick hit me on the boiler. Mr. Lennox pondered and massaged his chin. Then he jumped over the brick wall. Mr. Lennox, you, you can't be in here. You'll get in trouble if you're seen. You won't tell anyone, would you? Asked Mr. Lennox as he pulled out a lighter from his pants pocket. He held it close to his face, using it as a light. He looked around Henry's boiler. Then he saw it. A brick laid on the running board. He glared up at the boiler. There was a firm 
blocky dent in it. His skin crawled as he peered down to the other end of the tunnel. The sun shone twice through the cutting of the opening from the cave in long ago and through the other end of the tunnel. Sharks that had been shunted into the tunnel from storage sat behind Henry, and a figure stood at the other end. Mr. Lennox's goosebumps seemed to get their own bumps. He shook himself, trying to become calm. Hello? He cried into the abyss. The figure stood there, emotionless. It seemed short, like it was a kid, but its legs ceased to exist, like it was half submerged into the cement of the tunnel, like it had been built into the tunnel. Mr. Lennox stumbled back before beginning to run back to Henry. He faltered, remembering the brick. He grabbed the brick off the running board and took a glance back. The figure was getting closer. It had passed the cutting in the middle and seemed to glide through the cement towards him. Mr. Lennox ran, jumped over the wall, and rolled on his back, cradling the brick in his arms. He panted as Henry stared dumbfounded. What happened? Who were you talking to? Mr. Lennox wiped his brow as he presented Henry the brick. Maybe it wasn't a dream. Henry sat in the tunnel once more. The sun was just setting over the mountainside. He was unsteady. He hoped Mr. Acheron would come soon. He waited and waited and waited, but he never came. The trees gave their last tussle. As the sun finally submerged itself, the black void of the sky was above him now. At one time, Henry feared it, falling into the grand void above him. Now, he feared the abyss he sat in. He felt as if someone was watching him. Far inside the tunnel, the tree suddenly blew as a harsh wind entered the valley and played with him as the mighty pines fought valiantly. The wind soon swirled down into the tunnel. It swerved between all of Henry's gaps, sweeping the dust away. Henry felt violated as the wind died down. He heard it again. There was a thump as another brick hit him on the boiler. He certainly felt it this time. It was real this time. The sound pierced his ears as a few trucks awoke before being submerged in the earth that fell. Soon, more and more trucks awoke as more and more recovered. They were being buried alive. Henry watched as dirt and stone surrounded his wheels. The buffers on his tender were soon covered in layers of rocks. His breathing was uneasy. He was gasping for breath. He tried to scream again, but it didn't work. Something in him refused to yell, to scream for help. Alas, the stone and soil that sat in front of him began to bulge. It rocketed up in front of him as a figure of a man shot up in front of Henry, limping forward. His hand grabbing for his running board, he was halfway submerged in the rock. It was almost as if he was trying to grab for Henry to pull him out, to save him. But when he grabbed onto his running board, Henry felt himself being pulled down into the stone. Henry tried to scream once more, but still, he couldn't. He watched in horror as he was slowly dragged down farther and farther into the... Hello, Henry, stumbled a raspy voice. Mr. Acheron stood in front of the tunnel. The earth seemed to vanish from around him, but the lump of a human in the tunnel still held on to his running board, its legs halfway out of the ground. I wanted to see if you were okay. I meant to tell you earlier, but my wife wasn't feeling... Mr. Acheron paused. He adjusted his glasses as he peered into the darkness. He saw it too, the human figure leaning on Henry's running board. He began to weep at the sight of it. I'm sorry, he stuttered. Mr. Acheron fell onto his knees, crying. As if on cue, the figure sank into the earth. Henry never experienced his cave again. He and Mr. Acheron kept both their mouths shut about the incident. They didn't tell anyone. Every night after, he always saw Mr. Acheron. The two would always say hello to each other. Henry could only guess that he didn't need to come anymore, but Mr. Acheron still chose to do so. And that's my story, finished Henry. I had a tunnel story. This isn't fair. I want to recall. Wh what? That's a terrible story. A tunnel ghost? 
Who would believe that? Snapped Fulcrum. You tell a better story. Snapped Thomas. I would. I'm just waiting for the right time. Chortled Fulcrum. Edward gently smiled at Henry. Henry smiled back. Who's next? Quizzed Gordon. The engines were now enthralled to hear each other's tales. I suppose I have a story. Peter a quiet voice. All eyes fall on Molly. I call this one later or never. I really hate the word later. What's there to do later? It's one thing you have something to do with someone later, but the pressure and anxiety before later, sometimes you don't know what's going to happen. Like like when someone says, I need to talk to you later. Talk to you about what? What did they want to say? What did you do wrong? What did they find out? Oh, there's the petty later, where you know you did something wrong, and they say, We'll talk about this later. Just say what you want to say now. You'll be wasting both of our time holding your breath. Just say what you want to say. Because sometimes there won't be a later. Sometimes people will say later and never get back to it. And you never see that person again. It's anxiety-inducing to think about. What did they want to say? Was it about you? Was it about them? What did they want to say? And you'll never know. You'll never see them again. Good riddance. Sometimes those people can just be terrible. You feel like you have to change everything about yourself for those people. You'll be forced to put on a facade. Sometimes you'll always be like that. That's why I made the decision to be myself. But that's not what people liked. They shunned me. Sometimes I need to tell myself I shouldn't cry. But I always end up crying. I try to save my tears for when I'm alone in the shed so no one comes and makes fun of me and judge me. The other times it just comes out and I hate myself for it. I didn't act like myself before with the other engines. I used to be one of the queens of the railway. I didn't like that. They would always talk about others behind their backs. For a time I thought I really belong with them. That wasn't true. They were just rude. Now that I really separated myself away, I felt like I had no one. I was at the station one day, waiting to pull a passenger train. Passengers flocked the platform getting into my coaches. Elizabeth, Rain, and Claire. Those were the names. I actually felt like I could be myself around them. I usually rambled to them in the sheds about the nasty things the other engines would say about me. Just thinking about it makes me swell up. My anxiety was is terrible. They were some of the few people who respected Molly. All the others still called me Morgan. That hurt. They really knew how to make an engine feel comfortable. Sometimes it feels hypocritical though. Are we any better than the other engines? We would talk about others behind the bunkers. Are we that much better? Elizabeth, Rain, and Claire always said it was fine. You're venting. It's different from making rude comments. But we would sometimes make fun of them. I can remember one time when Claire poked fun at Jasper, one of the bigger engines, and called him a lump of shit on wheels. That wasn't very kind. Anyways, on this day, I saw the manager strolling over to me. My train was about to depart, so when he came up and realized the time, he muttered those words. We need to talk later. The guard blew his whistle, but I didn't leave. You're off to go, Molly, said the manager. He was one of the few who respected Molly. But... I stayed. I waited for him to say what he needed to say. I didn't tell him that, of course. I just kind of stared at him like a deer in headlights. Off you go, he said again. Driver and fireman tried to urge me on. Alas, they took control and I reluctantly set off. I could hear the laughing of the other engines making fun of me from the sheds as I set off. How late did I leave? A minute or so. Those felt like very long minutes. I hoped it hadn't been any longer. It must have been so awkward. What did he need to say? What did he need to talk to me about? It was frightening. I know you're probably here to listen to one of those spooky stories. Maybe... Why is Molly here so early in the timeline? She should arrive when season 9 happens. Or... What gave Molly her anxiety and slash or PTSD? Or even, how is she breaking the fourth wall like that? How does she know about season nine? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is your classic anxiety Molly story. 
to you. This may just seem like another classic Molly story. Just to check off on the list to fill in a space for the only female character. And that may be right, but for me, this felt like a real horror story. What did the manager want to say to me? What possible horrid thing was he going to tell me? You're going to be scrapped. Or no, we're painting you in a nasty color so that the other engines can make fun of you. We're taking your coaches away. I shuddered at the thought of my girls leaving me. They were everything to me. I loathed for my return trip when I reached the station at the end of the line. I suppose I was lost in thoughts before I was interrupted by my cousins. Are you okay? He asked. Oh, hi, Alfred. I stuttered. Molly, what happened? He asked. He was one of those engines who based their personalities on helping others. He was one of the few people that I liked. I didn't feel like I could always be open with him, though. He was one of those people who would result in physical violence. I remember once when he found out Angela was bullying me. She had pushed her through a set of buffers that ended in a slope. She fell into a pond. A pond! After that, we never saw her again. I'm surprised Alfred wasn't sent away with her. Molly. He pulled me out of my thoughts. Nothing. Nothing happened. Yes. Nothing. Molly. Alfred. Nothing happened. He sighed. It was obvious he knew that something had happened. My face probably showed it all. My coaches obviously knew not to tell him, even after he inquired with them. He sighed his gruesome sigh. You know I'm always here for you. Right? Molly? Yeah? And you can always tell me everything. Right? Yeah? I was being short with him. I really did not want to talk to him. Right. Well, when you're ready, I'm here for you. I stuttered on my words. I felt bad for not telling him now. I should have really told him. I'll tell you later. There it was. Those loathsome words. I hate them. I really do. But before I could explain myself farther, I had to leave. I had to go back to the other end of the line and confront my horrors. I shuddered. No. All of me shuddered from my smoke box to my tender. I felt ill. I wanted to spill my ashtray. I really didn't want to go back, but I was urged on. What urged me on? What would there be? Dual clouds covered the sky. But every so often, a hint of sunlight breached through, covering me in its light. Maybe I could be getting a reprint, I told myself. Then the gray sky covered the sun. No, your paint will get taken away. Then the sun breached again. Maybe you could be promoted to express duties. No, Jasper would take it away from you. I argued and argued with myself until you don't know what you're talking about. Do I? Yeah, you don't. There's always some good, even in the worst. It's weird when you're having an argument with yourself. I I was so used to being disappointed in whatever happened because that's what usually happened. But this one time, my positivity actually fought. Soon the sun shone brightly down. Yeah, who knows what could happen? Anything could happen. I can pull the express. I can deal with Jasper and the other engine's criticism all by myself. I don't need some silly voice telling me how to act or how to feel. I can feel how I want to feel. Everything actually felt good. I pulled into the station cheerfully where the manager was waiting. Molly! He cheered. Hello, sir. I whistled. What did you want to talk to me about? I've been thinking about how Jasper and the others have been treating you. I've been looking into how to end their bullying. I found a railway that's currently being started, the Northwestern. They're young and are looking for engines to be loaned to help with its construction. Would you care to go work with them? There would be many new phases for you to be introduced to, and you could actually be yourself there. I felt happier than ever before! Yes, sir, that would be amazing, sir! Great, you can go over this evening. Suddenly, I faltered. S sir could Elizabeth Frayne and Claire come with me? The manager, who had been walking away to make some calls, slowly turned back to me. Oh, they're needed here. He said slowly. I became a deer in headlights again. I don't know if they need any coaches over there. And we still need them here for your train. We can't just replace them. My smoke box door felt like it had been sucked inward, like I was staring at him through this dark void. They couldn't come with me? 
Why? It would be so comforting if they could. Before I could control it, the stream of tears ran down my face. Oh, Molly, don't. What do we have here? Cackled Jasper as he entered the station. What was up with this timing? I don't know how long it lasted until I had to leave. I just sat there, dazed in my thoughts. They swelled in my head, torturing me. I truly felt alone. And then I remembered Alfred. That's the last thing I said to him. I probably wasn't going to see him for a long time. I may never see him again. I was being tortured by my own thoughts. I'm sorry. I know that really wasn't a ghost story. And it's just a stupid... No, no, Molly. Th that was... That was a very good tell, replied Edward. I'm sorry. It's stupid. I should... I, for one, cut in Gordon, very much liked it. The true horror of psychology... Like, you even know what a psych, uh, psych, um, whatever it is, uh, is, a uh, good story, Molly. Fulcrum stayed quiet. He felt uncomfortable by the story. Edward could tell. Molly had just opened up to him about what his bullying was like. Edward looked at him, wondering if he could ever change. The thought lingered on the back of Edward's mind of what Fulcrum was like before he arrived. He thought he may get an answer when Fulcrum did speak up. I have a story, he announced. The engines kept quiet, letting him continue. A real one. I call it. Tim the Evil Train 2, Electric Boogaloo, the epic sequel. A cackling erupted from the back of the shed. Fulcrum turned to a face of disgust. Who the hell left this truck in the shed, Thomas? I, I don't know. He just kind of showed up. I'm kind of scared. The truck's rusted frames were decorated with dilapidated planks. Crazed eyes stared at the engines with a painfully wide grin. Burnt crate sat in it with its own bunker. May I or may I not tell my tail engines? Edward smiled warmly. Well, if you wish, I don't see why not. Besides, chuckled Thomas, I'm sure anything would be better than Evil Tim. Hey, Evil Tim is my masterpiece. It's a fan fiction. Now shut up and let the truck speak. Thank you, engines. I call this tale. It's raining somewhere else. Once upon a time, soon to come, two little engines left from home. They wanted to be free from the shackles its builder had left them. The engines traveled far and wide, but their builder didn't want them to leave. So what he did, he took chase. One engine had many adventures and made many friends. The other was forced to tag a log, dragged along the way. It mourned its miserable life. Their builder followed them every puff of the way. At last, the builder caught up to the engines. There was a long, arduous battle that ended three separate ways. However, in each ending, the happier engine came out on top. That engine soon found a home where it was loved by all. As for the other engine, well, in each ending, he was tortured beyond what was fathomable. He was tortured forever and always and always and always and always and always. He seeks a way out of his pain, but maybe it will never leave him. The end. That was... A short story, scoffed Thomas. Now it must come true. The truck burst into a hyena laughter. The engines and crew shut their eyes shut as it released a new music scream. As the truck's laugh faded, all the engines looked back into the shed. But there was no truck. Where did it go? The engines remained quiet until Fulcrum spoke up again. May I tell my tale now? Hmm. As long as it's not evil to me. Fine. I call this one the Handless God. 
Fulcrum sat impatiently at Vickerstown. It was late, and he was meant to be on his way to Timoth a long time ago. However, Thomas had been playing and bumping the trucks hard beforehand. So hard, in fact, that he had derailed some. Other trucks had to be fetched. Thomas searched and searched until he found an old set at the back of the yards. He shoved them onto Fulcrum's train. The guard and Fulcrum's crew were talking. Station Master notified the stations ahead that we'd be running late, told the guard. All right, thanks, Chuck, replied Fulcrum's driver, Samuel Collins. Of course. How have the kids been? asked Chuck. They've been great. How's the wife? Good. We just had a firstborn last week. Well, is he doing well? Very. He's the cutest little bugger you've ever seen. Not to say yours ain't. I get what you mean. Looks like Thomas is here. Interjection of the fireman, Rally Hartfield. We better get going. The three parted ways and took up their posts. Hello, greeted Chuck as he sidled into the brake van. Thomas took it and shunted it up. Oh, hey Chuck, be careful. Fulcrum's in a right mood. Oh, I will, laughed Chuck. That engine has never given me a problem. He gets to you eventually, remarked Thomas, rolling his eyes. Well, we'll see about that, won't we, Delilah? Asked Chuck, petting his brake fan. Yippers! Chirped Delilah. Be careful of those trucks as well, warned Thomas. I wish I could tell you if they're a troublesome lot or they actually have a defect. Keep a close eye on them, and a closer eye on Fulcrum. Righto, saluted Chuck. He leaned over the side of the brake fan. He put his whistle in his mouth and removed the green flag from his back pockets. Soon, the train began with a very reluctant whistle from Fulcrum. Chuck came back into Delilah's cab and waved at Thomas. Thomas returned the whistle as the train set out into the night. The train swept gracefully through the night. Fulcrum kept to himself, trying to make up for lost time. He was so janky with the trucks, over that he kept them up. They moaned and groaned, all very tired. Thomas had added a fussy lot at the back out of spite. The vans at the back were old and complained about such. It drove Chuck restless. He tried reading a book, but the grumbling made him skip every word. Not from... Eastern of Hudson is Little Valley Sleepy Hollow, he grumbled. Soon, a light screech began to fill the air. It grew louder and louder as the train began to slow more and more. Chuck knew what this was. The old vans had run a hot box. He turned on Delilah's brakes as the train stopped in the middle of a valley. Chuck ran ahead to Balladrine, a halt not so far up the line, and called ahead, warning that they had stopped. Then he came back as Samuel and Riley looked over the train. Chuck checked over the old vans as Samuel and Riley told Fulcrum what happened. We'll have to wait until they cool down. Fulcrum was annoyed. But we must get going now. We can't keep the fact director waiting. He'll understand about the but no and he jolted the train forward. Chuck was looking in between the trucks who were getting some rest. He sat between the last two. These trucks need to get brake pipes added. Then I wouldn't have to be so far away from my boy. Maybe I could mention it to the boss and the train lurched forward as Fulcrum tried to pull away. Chuck was right between the two Vance buffers as it happened. Get back in place, snarled Sam. We have to wait for Chuck to finish inspecting the Vance. I'll go check on him, added Riley, more than happy to get away from their engine. She walked back all the way to the end of the train, but couldn't find him. Chuck, she called into the night. There was no response. Hey, Delilah, have you seen... As she turned to face the brake van, she found her sobbing. Hey, hey, what, what's wrong? But Delilah kept crying, refusing to answer Riley. Riley climbed up into the cab and looked over Delilah, but still, no sign of Chuck. Alas, she grabbed a lantern and started to look up and down the train. As she ran to the last two vans, she stopped dead in her tracks. She said nothing as the light shone down onto the body of Chuck. His head was crushed between the buffers of the van and was gruesomely popped as his skull was crushed. Uh, oh, oh, God, it. She stumbled back, almost falling down. She faltered as she ran up the train. Fulcrum, you killed him! Killed who? Chuck, he's dead, and it's all because of... She began to cry. Samuel held Riley. He darted his eyes to Fulcrum, who was rolling his own. And that's it. Now, I know it's not as good as Tim the Evil Engine, but that's it!
Yes. No, as I was saying. Please tell me this isn't true. Fuck, 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 fuck. It is. I I remember, Chuck. I I remember that night. I, I was the one who put those vans on the train. I, I, I killed him? Thomas began to panic as Edward rushed forward to soothe the little engine. I don't see what the fuss is about. Do you have no decency? Boom, Gordon. Show some respect. You killed that man. At least show some emotion. What? Do you have no feelings? Of course, just not for anyone here, but for myself. Of course, he scoffed. The engines were apart. Look, if we are going to end this night on a sour note, can I at least tell my story before we all have a brawl? All eyes landed on Thomas, now waiting for his story. I still think Evil Tim is the best- Shut up, will you! You're not even getting your story straight! Do I now? Yeah, you aren't. And how would you know? Because... I know the real Tim. But Tim doesn't exist. And how did you know the story even existed? That, um... The incident last year. November 1st, 1924. 1.32 AM. Almost one year ago. I'm going to keep it short. I call this one the Els Viaduct Incident. Not so long ago, to the western side of the island was the line before Thomas's. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever your brain rot infected brain is thinking about, like Timothy the Ghost Engine. Stop it. That's not true. I only had sisters. Two, to be correct. They were Tawny and Audrey. You can only guess where the second name came from. They were built at the same time as me. But not with me. They were built at A.W. Drying Co. Liam probably won't let me go into specifics since they want to make it its own yet another tale episode blah 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 blah. But here's what Liam won't tell you. Clara might though. That's why she's writing this. Anyways, Tawny was... incredibly... depressed. Oh my god, engines having deep emotions? That's not how they should work. Yeah, yeah, I hear you in the audience, Ashley. Alright, so her depression was, like, really bad. Doctors told her that she had something called, like, melancholy. Now then, the line was, like, falling apart, and it was just, like, a really shitty place. Not so long before that, one of the old coffee pots blew up on the Elves viaduct. There was no viaduct after that. The line suffered dreadfully from the incident. Ever wonder why you can't find that much information on Tawny? That's because if you look up the Els Viaduct incident on your Google thingy, the boiler explosion overshadows the real incident. It all became too much for her. The line was cutting costs at anything they could do, selling away the engines like Audrey. Without Audrey, Tawny felt like nothing. I wish I could have been there for her. The bridge wasn't complete. What do you get when you have a runaway and an incomplete bridge? You can probably only guess what happened next, can't you? And that's the real story of Tim, snubbed Thomas. He didn't say any more. The engines murmured to each other. Is it true? They asked each other. I thought Thomas was an E too. Thomas has siblings? Indeed he did, chuckled a voice. It was a man that was the same body shape as Chuck. But where the head used to be was a glowing pumpkin. Oh fuck, it's Chuck! Oh god, I'm going to die! Fulcrum, this is all your fault! It was you who put the van on my train! You're going to hell too! The pumpkin fell and splatter on the ground to reveal- The, the fat, fat director! director! Exclaimed Thomas and Fulcrum in unison. Ho 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 ho! It looks like you engines enjoyed yourselves. Edra beamed. Indeed we did, sir. That's wonderful. I had hoped to arrive soon enough to tell my own story, but it's awfully. Hey! A cuckoo bird snatched the top hat off the fact director's head and flew high into the sky. It glided around the shed before dropping the hat right onto Thomas's funnel. Hey! I have a Halloween costume! Henry, you'll be in your tunnel for always and always. The bird chuckled and flew away. Happy Halloween! I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight for my monster from his slab began to rise and suddenly to my surprise he did the monster mash it was a graveyard smash it caught hold in a flash he did the monster mash from my laboratory in the Castellese to the monster in the bedroom to the vampire's feast 
the ghouls all came from the hunt of the boots to come to a Crickets chirped as the engines dreamed peacefully in their sheds. Fulcrum snored loudly, as always. He was unaware of the crunching of ballast and the giggling. A roll of squishy white paper hit Fulcrum in the eye. Yowch! More rolls flew through the air, tangling themselves around the engine. In no time, he was covered in toilet paper strips. Fulcrum shouted in protest as the kids ran away. All the engines woke up and laughed at Fulcrum. Fulcrum was very embarrassed. Get back here and restore my majesty. Tim the evil engine will get you for this.